Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Richard Widmark in Irvin Anthony's Decatur on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we tell the story of an American naval officer, Stephen Decatur, and we have used in doing so the book about him written by Irvin Anthony. Decatur, as every American knows, was one of the first heroes of the American Navy. He won his fame against the pirates of Tripoli in what has been called the greatest little engagement in naval history. His father was of the Navy also. And in so devoting his life at that early stage of our country's history, Stephen was not only following in family tradition, but founding, however little he could have guessed it, though perhaps he did, the traditions of the greatest navy in the world. Today, when those traditions are more honored than ever, and when our country's need of a strong navy is as great as ever, is a good time to honor the memory of Stephen Decatur. And to play the part in our story tonight, we are fortunate to have that fine young Hollywood actor, Richard Widmark. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Decatur. At Christmas, as on every memorable occasion, when you want a card that reflects your own good taste, one that your friends will single out to show to others, go to the fine store displaying Hallmark cards. Shop in the comfortable knowledge that Hallmark cards are always socially correct and warmly received. For that Hallmark on the back carries its own tradition. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction. It says you cared enough to send the very best. And now Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Irvin Anthony's Decatur, starring Richard Widmark. Susan, I want you to know I love you. Hmm? I want you to know it and remember it. Stephen, what are you doing up at this hour? It doesn't even light up. Stephen, where are you going? Go back to sleep, Susan. I'm sorry I wakened you. I only meant to kiss you, but you awakened. Go back to sleep, darling. Stephen, where are you going? Please, don't worry. I have an appointment. I hope to return long before it's time for you to get up. Go back to sleep, darling. What kind of an appointment? Who is? Goodbye, darling. Stephen! You walk down the stairs and out into the streets. It is still dark and there is no one in sight. Behind the shaded windows, people are sleeping and dreaming of the morrow. For them, tomorrow may come. But this may be the last morning of your life. Your footsteps sound unreal and eerie, echoing on the damp cobblestones. You shiver a little and you pull your cloak closer about you. And you wonder by what road you came to this morning. Then suddenly, with a startling clarity, you see the road and yourself at the end of it. And you hear yourself, a youth again, saying the words that led you toward this destiny. Look at the words on the scroll, Mother. Reposing special trust. Valor, fidelity, and abilities. Appoint you, Stephen Decatur, midshipman in the Navy of the United States. And you are to serve and follow such orders, etc., etc., according to the rules and discipline of war and the usage of the sea. And there's the President's own signature, John Adams. War and the usage of the sea. The sea. But, Mother, it's life. Life at its fullest and most exciting. Oh, you'd know, Mother. You'd know if you'd ever stood on a quarter deck with a white sail filling the wind above you and the sun on your face and salt on your lips and all the world waiting for you beyond the prow of your ship. 
you'd know if you'd ever ridden out a storm. You and your ship, flesh and wood, braced against the weather. You'd know if you'd ever lain on a deck at night and watched the mast of your ship move slowly past the stars. When a boy feels like that, he can't be kept on land then. I know. When we were young, the sea was your mistress. And so it will be with our son. Well, if you would have me stay, I'll stay, Mother. Bless you for that. But I'll not keep you, Stephen. A man must choose his own destiny, regardless of the tears of women. God go with you. And Congress has voted to give the Navy three frigates. It's a beginning at last of a Navy for the United States. And what's the first mission of this Navy? To protect our commerce. To keep the French from capturing any more of our merchant ships. Do you realize they've captured over 300 of our merchant ships? Taken them to their own ports and sold them? How long can a situation like that be tolerated? We'll stop them now. <laughs> well, who's the captain of your ship, boy? John Barry. I'm assigned to the frigate, the United States. Ah, uh, you'll be with one of the finest naval men in the country. It's an infant navy, I grant you that. But I can look back to the days of the Revolution, when the navy was so small that even John Barry didn't always have a command. But we're on our way now. Yes, sir, we're on our way now. That was the beginning. And then came the days that were spent learning the ship from mast to hold, learning navigation, learning our relation to the future. I hope you men feel the same way about your ship and your navy as I do. This crew is a seed of great endeavor. It is your lot to build tradition, to establish usages, to mold the protection America needs and has the right to expect from our Navy. Days of fair winds and days of storm. Days when the eyes searched the horizon for the enemy and finally found it. Days when one met the enemy and learned how to attack him, how to rescue him from the sea when the battle is won, and then how to deal with him. Why did you fire on us? Sit still until I swing this boat around. I don't see any more members of your crew in the water. We were astonished by your attack, sir. We did not know the United States was at war with the French Republic. No, sir, but you knew that the French Republic was at war with the United States, that you were taking our merchant vessels every day and crowding our countrymen into prison at Basseterre to die like sheep. Oh, sir. Now keep still or I'll throw you back into the sea where you belong. <laughs> Days spent in the service of the Navy at sea. And at the end of them, glory. Stephen Decatur, it is my pleasure to inform you that the President of the United States has appointed you Lieutenant in the Navy of the United States. <laughs> Lieutenant Decatur, please sit down. I have a problem to discuss with you. As you know, one of our ships, the Philadelphia, has been captured by the pirates of Tripoli. Yes, sir. We dare not leave the ship in their hands. As your first command, I want you to take the Intrepid and prepare her for a cruise of 35 days with full allowance of water and provisions for 75 men. Your orders are to board and burn the Philadelphia in the harbor of Tripoli. It shall be done, sir. I walked out of Captain Barry's quarters with excitement pounding inside me. I was proud to have been chosen. And I was young enough to feel a sudden oneness and fellowship with the Greek triremes and the Roman galleys, with all the men in centuries past who sailed for country and for adventure. The will of my commander was at my shoulder, strong with trust. And as I crossed the deck, through the late afternoon mists, I could see the flag of my country, a young flag, 
the youngest in all the world. And I stopped to salute it, thinking, I'll not break faith with you or what you stand for. We'll show the world that we are a strong people and that those who fail to treat our flag and our ships with dignity and respect must pay the consequences. All right, men, follow me. We'll board the Philadelphia and set fire to her. Got off to Philadelphia just in time, sir. Even out here, you can feel the heat of that fire. Yes, it's the heat that's making her guns go off. None of the crew are on board now. I'm grateful for that breeze. It came up just in time. We're making good speed. The fire on that ship is lighting up the entire harbor. It's doing more than that, my friend. The fires from that ship are lighting up the world. There it is, written in flame for everyone to read. Keep your hands off our ships and our people. We don't like it, and we won't tolerate it. It was Indian summer when I came home on leave. By then, I had been promoted to captain, and I was entertained with some of my officers by Mayor Wheeler of Norfolk. I had only to look in his daughter Susan's eyes to know that here was the beginning and the end of all things for me. Do you think they've missed us at the party? I'm sure that Mother has. You know, I just realized we've completely forgotten all the proprieties. A well-bred lady doesn't leave a house full of guests to go walking beside the sea with a man she's known such a short time. Oh, but I feel I've known you a long time. Why, when I met you tonight, I even felt I recognized you. Oh, Stephen, that's a sweet compliment. No compliment at all. I'm not good at compliments, just the plain truth. And, uh, that's another thing. I feel I have to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. I didn't say I didn't like it. But perhaps I ought not to listen to it. Oh, but you must tonight, or else we have nothing to say to each other. Stephen, look out there. There's your world. You have to return to it, and I must remain in mine. Listen, Susan... I've heard I'm to command a squadron of gunboats stationed in the Chesapeake and headquartered at Norfolk. Now, that would mean a position on land so that I could... Uh, well, at least for the time being. For the time being? And then what? I don't know. How can a sailor ever know? But I do know I love you, Susan. You don't doubt that, do you? Or don't you believe it's possible at a first meeting like this? I wouldn't have believed so. Till tonight. Susan. You mean... Susan, my darling. Then, uh, then you'll marry me? And live alone in some little house on the cliff, watching the sea that takes you away, wondering when I'll ever see you again? Susan, I, I must tell you how I feel about the Navy. I suppose every man in it feels the same way, or he wouldn't have joined it. I know. You needn't say any more. No, no, no. Please listen to me. You didn't let me finish. You don't have to. Let me give you my answer now. I will marry you, Stephen. You... You will. And, and you're prepared for what... Stephen, do you we... think I'd say yes if you'd spoken differently? Then I've found my happiness. A home to dream of while I'm away. A home to come back to again and again. Until my last voyage, darling. And then there'll be the little house on the cliff for both of us. For the rest of our lives. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Decatur, starring Richard Widmark. Remember when you were little and your mother selected a storybook as the Christmas gift for your cousins, and how happy you were because mother or dad would read it to you first before it was wrapped for Christmas giving? 
Well, a lot of folks manage to get that same thrill of anticipating the receiver's pleasure when they buy their Christmas cards, particularly Hallmark cards. It's fun to go over each card and say, this reminds me of the time Fred and I fell into the pond while skating. I think I'll send it to him. Or, why, if this doesn't look just like Carol when she played the angel in the school play, let's send it to the Sawyers. In the Hallmark collection of Christmas cards, you'll find Merry Santas and Snowmen, cards that depict the hushed stillness of a country church in the snow, the glowing warmth of a yuletide log crackling on the hearth, or the angel serenading the newborn babe. There are also ones that take scenes from the everyday world and bathe them with the Christmas spirit, such as famous paintings of Norman Rockwell, Winston Churchill, Grandma Moses, and others. Yes, it is fun to send a different card to everyone on your list. It's a compliment to your friends, too. For then you can be as gaily whimsical or as frankly sentimental as you wish. In fact, you'll find Hallmark Christmas cards that seem especially written and created for each one on your list. And remember, that Hallmark on the back tells in its own way that you cared enough to send the very best. Now here is the second act of Irvin Anthony's Decatur, starring Richard Widmark. You wonder by what road you came to this morning. And then suddenly, with startling clarity, you see events long past, all leading to this destiny. You see the one woman your heart will hold eternally standing beside you in her bridal white. You remember the courage of her smile and the tragedy of her eyes when you left for your command during the War of 1812. You remember the acrid, bitter smell of cannon smoke and the deafening thunder of cannon in your ears. You remember the feeling that rose inside you when you glimpsed the flag you followed through the smoke of battle. You remember the glory of final victory and coming home. Commodore Decatur, your countrymen have met in this room tonight to do you honor. By your own labor, you have helped establish the foundations of the Navy. By your own courage, you have helped establish the traditions of the Navy. You have earned the confidence of the men under you. You have earned the confidence of presidents, of Congress, and of your people. Here, here. Here, here. Gentlemen, I thank you. And in thanking you, I give you a toast. Our country... In her intercourse with foreign nations, may she always be in the right. But our country, right or wrong. Darling, how was the banquet? The food was excellent, but a little too rich. And uh, so, I'm afraid, were the speeches. <laughs> I see. Oh, I almost forgot. James Barron is waiting to see you in the sitting room. Oh. All right. Well, Commodore Decatur, I believe. Sit down, Barron. What brings you to my door? How does it feel to hear the cheers of the multitude? I knew once that I'd forgotten. Why did you come here? What do you want? Stephen, you served under me in the Mediterranean. We were friends then. There's a ship ready for a commander, the Columbus. I want that command. I see. Baron, you were tried by court-martial at the request of your own crew. Your officers charged you with neglecting to clear your ship for action and for not doing your utmost to take or destroy a British vessel in an encounter. You were found guilty. Yeah, guilty. My whole life given to the Navy and found guilty. But my sentence has been served. I was suspended from Navy duty for five years. That time is more than up. Your ship, the Chesapeake, is the only ship in the Navy to be disgraced. You are responsible for the one blemish on naval history. The lives of American men were lost through your negligence. I never thought you'd be my enemy, Stephen. I don't say I wasn't wrong. I was wrong. But I've served the sentence that was imposed on me. Yes, yes, I know how you feel. I know how any man must feel in your position. You were a Navy officer. You know, as every Naval officer does know, that to fail in wartime is criminal. There can be no second chance. That sounds hard, I know. But hardness is part of strength when men's lives are in your hands. 
as a man who has liked you and respected you and feels sorry for you now. I'd like to help you get that command, Baron. But as a naval officer of conscience, I cannot do it. And I will not do it. Then you and I are enemies from this moment, Decatur. <laughs> Stephen Decatur. Sir, I have been informed of various remarks that you have made in the intention of ruining my reputation. It is my opinion that these remarks call for redress from your hand. Under the circumstances, I feel that I am entitled to the choice of weapons, place, and distance. Mr. James Barron, sir... From your manner of proceeding, it appears to me that you have come to the determination to fight someone and that you have selected me for that purpose. I must take leave to observe that your object would have been better attained had you made this decision during our late war, when your fighting might have benefited your country as well as yourself. However, I accept your challenge and refer you to my friend, Commodore Bainbridge, who is fully authorized by me to make any arrangement he pleases as regards weapons, place, or distance. Susan, I've had a long tour of shore duty. There's a good possibility that I may soon be sent to sea. I'd like to go over all our affairs with you so that you'll be able to manage in case I, uh, I, I should be away for some time. Something's wrong. What is it? No, 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 nothing's wrong. Darling, I haven't been your wife all these years for nothing. We haven't had nearly the time together that I hoped we would. Have you been happy, darling? Very happy. If our life together should end tomorrow. Yes. If it should end tomorrow. If it should end tomorrow. I would have to say... to have known you and loved you... Even for a few brief years, was to find more happiness than most women find in a lifetime. If it should end tomorrow, I would want you said to you. Thank you. Thank you for your love, for your trust, for the excitement that has welled up inside me when my ship was headed home, for being on the wharf waiting when we docked. Thank you for your eyes, for your lips, for your beauty. If it should end tomorrow, I would want to have said to you, this I know beyond question, beyond doubt. My heart will know only your image through all eternity. Even you're turning a little sad, hasn't it? Why, Stephen? No reason, no reason at all. We just got a little sentimental, a little heavy about ourselves, I guess. No. You were speaking as though something was going to happen. Tomorrow. Yes, yes, darling, it is. At noon, I'm going to board my ship and go over her from stem to stern. Stephen, I love you. I love you. Susan. You walk down the street... The sky is beginning to lighten in the east. You wonder if you'll ever see the dawn again. And you find yourself praying that if you do not, God in his infinite mercy will take care of Susan Decatur. All too soon you find yourself at the appointed place. Your seconds are waiting for you. The hour is at hand. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Commodore Bainbridge. I can't tell you how I regret this morning's business. Then let me talk to Baron. It's not too late. But it is too late. There's a code for a man of arms of our generation, Commodore. It must be met. I'm going to shoot for Baron's hip. I don't want to kill him. You're ready, sir? Mr. Baron is ready? I'm ready. Good morning, Commodore Decatur. Mr. Barron. I hope upon meeting in another world, we will be better friends than we have been in this. I have never been your enemy, sir. Take station. 
I'm ready. Ready. Present. One. Two. My my last voyage. Susan. Stephen. The doctor is here. Let him help you. My last voyage. Stephen Decatur died on March 22nd, 1820. He need not have died except for a point of honor. Many other men have died like this. He's perhaps best known for those famous words of his. Our country may it always be in the right, but our country right or wrong. Many men too have felt like this and have so given their lives. And this is certain that as a lover of his country and as one of her earliest heroes, Stephen Decatur's name will live forever in the history of America. Mark and James Hilton will return in a moment. At Christmas, just when most of us would like to be at our gracious best, it seems we're all faced with that same problem. How can I stretch my money to cover everything? If your Christmas card budget is not the elastic kind, don't worry. For though I've mentioned this before, I think it's particularly good to remember at Christmas. Just because they are Hallmark cards doesn't mean they need be expensive. Yes, it's comforting to know that you can buy as many as 25 Hallmark Christmas cards for as little as $1. In fact, there's a Hallmark Christmas card to fit every taste and every budget. And of this you can be sure. When you choose a card with that Hallmark on the back, you know your friends will know. You cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Richard Widmark, that was a fine performance you gave. It's a genuine pleasure to welcome you again to our circle of guests. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. You know, uh, I've been looking forward to visiting you on Hallmark Playhouse because Hallmark cards really play an exceptional role in my life. Really? In what way? Well, you see, I'm what you might call a Christmas child. My birthday's on December 26th, and uh, you know what happens. <laughs> Almost everyone combines my Christmas presents with my birthday presents. And if it weren't for the separate birthday cards I receive, I'd never have a special day at all. <laughs> well, I, I certainly see what you mean, Dick, and we're glad that Hallmark cards meet the problem for you so well. For those double presents you get on Christmas, Dick, remind your family to take a look at our double page in life this week. It might give them some ideas on wrapping your gifts because it shows the beautiful Hallmark coordinated gift wrapping sets. I'll do that, Frank. Now, uh, what do you have for next week, Mr. Hilton? Next week, we're presenting a delightful O. Henry story called The Third Ingredient. And for our star, we are proud to welcome back that charming young actress, Anne Blythe. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Jean Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Watch for Richard Whitmark in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, Halls of Montezuma. The role of Susan tonight was played by Lorreen Tuttle. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week when James Hilton returns to present Anne Blythe in O. Henry's The Third Ingredient. And the week following, Mildred Cram's The Plumber, starring Robert Young. And the week after that, our special Christmas presentation, Hertha Pauli's The Story of Silent Night on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS to Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.